We are very pleased tonight to be able to welcome our uh, class facilitator. They uh, hail from uh, California, having uh, lived in the Midwest, but now living in California. And they have uh, extensive experience of uh, trying to reach into the hearts and minds of people to pull them toward a more democratic orientation. I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, in favor of those things that uh, that help ordinary people and sort of uh, pulling away from those things that don't help ordinary people or may even hurt ordinary people. So we're very pleased because we know that the working class in this country is suffering. And we understand that part of our responsibility is to help relieve the suffering through struggle. So it's in that context that the that we can under, that we understand most uh, uh, deeply the importance of the class we have tonight. So with no further delay, I'd like to turn the class the mic over to our presenter tonight, Ash Overton, and they will introduce themselves and proceed. Ash. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Ash Overton. I use they them pronouns. Um, and I, yeah, I come from this kind of, it's called deep canvassing, which I know many people um, know about. And I know that's the reason why I was asked to be here today. Deep canvassing has been around for, you know, about 12 years and um, I've been practicing it for 10 and it's been a real deep part of my organizing orientation. This like, I think you said reaching in or reaching out into these places where people are absolutely not with us, not even close and having deep conversations to move them, move them to our side, you know, as a real shorthand way of, of saying it. And, um, you know, I, I've worked in lots of different movements, uh, you know, starting with the LGBT movement, also with, you know, abortion access, um, onto abolition and immigration and different issues that I've worked on and mostly issue-based organizing, but also a lot of rural, small base building organizing in the South, which has been a really important thing for me to be a part of. I am from Mississippi um, from when I was a lot younger and then also from rural Minnesota. Um, it was like my background and actually from my family are people who would greatly benefit to be part of the struggle for working people, our working people, but really believe in the lie that um, you know, unions and, and the opportunities to organize working people are not good, you know, are not something they should participate in. That's like where I come from and who I come from. And so organizing around that and in the places that are home to me has always been, you know, a very important part of the work that I do. And now um, I'm with the New Conversation Initiative, which is an organization that strives to teach other organizations how to deep canvas. Um, how to do, use this skill um, and sometimes how to create this skill as well, which are, which are kind of different things. But I, I really love the, the title of this, um, this webinar of not deep canvassing, but deep organizing. Um, because I think in a lot of ways in the attempt to teach people deep canvassing, we've really begun divorcing it from organizing, um, which it, it can't be, right? It's a conversation. It's, it's, a, it's a way to have a conversation with people, but without organizing, it's meaningless, right? Understanding it as this theoretical mechanized thing, right, is, is, not, is, is not near what we need, right, to then go actually organize with it. And so I'm really excited to um, talk about deep canvassing today. As an, as an organizing practice, right? And like what it, what it requires to actually do this thing that I think we all really want. And I, I think just the things you're describing that are coming up show that, but um, you know, we need to move people. That's very clear. 70 million people voted for Trump, um, believe really deeply in that. And a lot of people, you know, also wanted Biden as the solution to Trump in the, you know, in the Democrat, as a Democratic nominee. And so I think there's a lot of conversations to be had. There's a lot of suffering happening. Um, so yeah, so I, that's who I am. Um, 
feel free to ask you know more questions as we go we're gonna have questions and answers at the end i don't want to spend too much time on who i am but um yeah so what i what i want to talk about next is how what is the history like how is deep canvassing created um so we can kind of understand and be on the same page what we're all talking about here um and so deep canvassing comes out of the marriage movement um complicated movement interesting movement in of itself but you know it's essentially came out of a really dark time when there were about 30 statewide losses in a row on votes on marriage equality um including in california in 2008 where even like bay area liberals you know were voting against this in extremely high numbers um and that movement was really it was kind of like what do we have to do what do we have to do to win if we can't even win here like what will this take and clearly we don't know and it was kind of an amazing moment in it's horrible it's, it feels hopeless and yet it allowed for someone to go out and just try something because anything needed to be tried right it was kind of like well what the hell because and and what we were doing what was learned in that is that you know a lot of canvassers were going out with this messaging of like um oh don't you know that if gay people aren't married there's like over a thousand rights they don't have access to don't you think that's unfair and most of the time people would say yeah they would agree right there wasn't a lot a lot of agreements around this and yet they would still at the end of the day not vote for it even though it seemed like they would even though polls were able to capture this idea that they would right these these oversimplified messaging kind of conversations were not really capturing what was going on at the end of the day. And what we learned um, after taking just a group of people out and going, hey, why don't we just go talk to the people who voted against us and ask them why and see if they'll talk to us. Let's just see what happens with no agenda, nothing else than to just see, will you talk to us and tell us something about this? And what was learned from that is that we didn't in our conversations actually address the underlying homophobia that was there for people um, but also fears of gay people and an attachment to this you know hetero heteropatriarchal institution of marriage which i think in like a modern time we don't see it for a lot of what it is but actually this idea that it's really important to orient a society around women being attached to men right that's like something that was deeply held um so all of these things swirling around underneath that are very emotional for people that are about power and oppression and all these things we were not talking about we were not finding ways to do that and we were not shifting their actual world view and deeply held beliefs under that and also addressing the real feelings that they were having gross feelings that are hard to look at but they're there they're real feelings that people are having and the biggest thing out of that and the reason why the facts we were giving people the facts about all these rights that wouldn't work is that actually you can't argue with feelings right facts can't actually take away someone's feelings it doesn't really work that way right and and that's one of the biggest things we learned is that actually you need to talk about these feelings um and so that is essentially what deep canvassing is, right? It's going out and moving someone towards you by having deep conversations, story-based conversations that you specifically know will help people process these feelings. And getting to that place where you know what stories to tell, where you know how to have these conversations varies by every single issue and everything that you're working on. And so, the process is, there's actually a process to figuring it out that I wanna talk about um, and figuring out what stories to tell. And so a lot of times we tell this story of deep canvassing is like, we discovered this conversation that works and now we've taken it and applied it to all these other issues and made it work. And that's true, this conversation does work. But the other thing that I think doesn't get talked about a lot is the process that was discovered. What are the steps you have to do to be able to figure out how to have a conversation like this and actually i think another thing i want to talk about is that every conversation in organizing is actually a pretty high skill nuanced thing right like organizing in some ways is just a series of conversations that we're having and we need them to be effective we need them to work and i think this moment that 
came was come up against in the marriage movement was like we have to figure out how to actually test this out and just give time to it um, so i want to talk a little bit about that process the process to discover how to make conversations that work um, and i know that's kind of vague but i'm kind of intentionally being vague because i think sometimes we get hung up on just the conversations to move people to change people's minds but recruiting people for things is a conversation that needs to work you know asking people to do like organizing itself is, is more than just these really big conversations with the people who don't believe what we believe um and i think that we as organizers need to invest more in a process that gives us that at all levels of the organizing that we're doing um, and that we need to strive to be more effective and make sure that we're being effective more often than I think that we do. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the process that we went through and what it means and how to kind of think about it and what the orientations are a lot of times within our movement that stop us from, have, from engaging in this process. And there are many things, there are many things that do that. And I'll get into that in a little second, but I wanna talk about this actual process. Um, so, this is going to look really simple <laughs> and in a way it kind of is um, but first and foremost i we have to believe in the idea that we have to test a script i think a lot of times we write scripts we make scripts and we just go with them and we give them to people to use and we base it off of a lot of different ideas and assumptions but rarely do we spend the time to go actually have the conversations and ask ourselves did it really work and how do we know? And how do we evaluate that? And how do we look at that? And take the time to keep having it until it works, right? So this process that I'm showing you here, again, it's really simple. Go have conversations with people towards what you want to get. If it's changing someone's mind, if it's recruiting somebody, if it's getting someone to show up at something, whatever. If it's like, you know, yeah, anyway, a kind of conversation, right? Go have it come back and evaluate that as a team. What's working, what's not, and why? And then make changes and try it again. And again, I know this sounds really simple, but it's just not something that we actually do very often for all the things that we're doing in organizing. And so I just wanna show this as like, this is the process that we went to. Um, and it doesn't get a lot of time for many reasons, right? We are not given a lot of time as organizers and within organizations to spend time just going through a process that doesn't even lead to the actual organizing, right? It's like you figure out the script, but you still have to recruit people, build a whole thing, build a campaign, do the thing, right? It's There's not really ever that much time given to this part of the process because it's not necessarily getting you an outcome, but actually investing in our scripts and investing in our conversations and understanding them deeply and how they should work and being effective down the road allows us to organize at such a different level with people and to build real power for ourselves. And partly it's to just know that we're actually being effective in our conversations. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the orientation that, I, that does come out of the leadership lab and does come out of this deep canvassing model that I think has really helped shape me as an organizer and the ability to really create effective conversations and a way of thinking about organizing um, that's useful. And one of this is to see organizing and the processes we go through as iterative, as iterative learning, a process to, a willingness to try something and engage in the process of discovery through it, discovering what works or what doesn't, and believing that you will get it. And I think there's like a piece of that that we don't always believe in, Belie like believing that this conversation will work and we can do it and that we just have to embrace this process and do it over and over again until we get there. And part of what's needed to do that is to be able to embrace failure completely. Like, being comfortable with trying things and not having it work having it fail miserably the first time the tenth time all that but having this iterative orientation to it that you know that each time it can get slightly better if you recognize what you learned each time that you did it and being comfortable 
in that place of just not being there um, and actually being curious about it rather than focusing on all the ways that it didn't work so that you become avoidant of that process. You become avoidant of doing that and striving for perfection rather than striving as a process. Um, so, right, that iterative learning, that embracing failure piece really goes together. And there's also within that actually building in time for evaluation into our processes. And I see this a lot with a lot of organizations that there's just not a lot of this time built in. You cannot go through an iterative process. You cannot learn something and then apply it to the next time you do it. If you're not taking time in your, in your schedule to actually evaluate together, to actually look at what you did and think about what worked and what didn't um, and the time to do that and to do it without any, it's not about giving a grade. It's not about, putting something down or feeling like you can't recognize things, but having a truly honest conversation about what happened and what didn't in this. Um, and then the last thing that is really important to building these conversations and building on our organizing and that I see in a lot of places is that we separate who's supposed to be doing the thinking in organizing and who's supposed to be doing. Um, and I'm not sure at what point this happened, and, and it doesn't happen in all movements in all places, but this idea that, you know, volunteers or certain people are supposed to have the conversations while someone else thinks about the, the plan, the campaign, the whatever, but actually I really believe that separating them is a real disservice to elevating our organizing and elevating our ability to be effective and run effective campaigns, because actually it still always just comes down to a conversation. All this other stuff, yes, it really matters, but if you're not having, an, at, at the heart of all of it, if the conversation that you are having and whatever you are striving to accomplish doesn't work, you're simply not actually going to accomplish what you want. And so having thinkers and doers be the same and to be evaluating together, to bring your volunteers into your evaluation process or your members or whoever into your evaluation process and also see yourself as part of the doing and the conversations as well. But that's a responsibility of organizing and organizers is I think a huge difference maker in all of this. So this is kind of this orientation piece and this process that we went through. And now I wanna talk you know, a little bit about from what I've seen, from my experience, consulting with a lot of organizations, working with a lot of organizations and moving this work forward of why I think people don't always do this or we don't always make time for it in our organizing. Um, you know, and again, if you're on this call and you're an organizer and you're like, I do this, I make time for this, I do these things, like, just so we know, I'm not here to try to be personally attacking everyone's individual things, but it's just a thing that I've seen that I think is important to emphasize. Um, and it's a piece of deep canvassing that led to the ability to have extremely impactful conversations. Um, so why we don't do this? And again, I'm using a collective we, but like, you know, why most people and why many people in the movement don't spend time for this. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a few pieces of this, but first and foremost, I wanna be clear that a lot of times we cannot leave out the fact that money and resources are a piece of this. Having money, having resources, and having time for organizing is a scarce, Thing that many of us are after and need and spend a lot of time trying to get and a lot, have to do a lot of things to make happen for ourselves. Um, and I 100% know that and have been in that chase of, of what that means and also what it means to satisfy funders and different people and all of that. And I know that that's like a huge, huge aspect of the decisions that everyone has to make in organizing. And I think there are some things that are part of a culture that we have and could shift to, to change what, how we approach this. So, um, and I think a lot of it is stories that we kind of tell ourselves um, and they're based in feelings, either avoiding these feelings or having these feelings of discomfort, of scarcity and of fear um, in our organizing and letting that make a lot of decisions for us and what we do. And so a lot of times what I hear in different organizing is, because deep canvassing, right, is a long conversation, right? 20, 30 minute conversations with voters, sometimes 40 minute conversations with voters. A lot of people are against long conversations because 
of funding because of different things. But one of the stories that we tell ourselves about asking volunteers to come for like an eight hour shift, have really intense, long conversations that are hard, is like, no one will talk to us for that long. I hear that all the time. Because I also really believe in having long and in-depth recruitment conversations too. And even in those kind of conversations, people are like, no one will show up, no one will stay that long, no one will have that kind of conversation. Volunteers don't want to do something that hard. Volunteers are, or members or whoever don't want to do these things. And this is a story that we're telling ourselves very often. It's an example. And I think one of the pieces that really gets to me with that and what I think is the orientation I wish we had towards organizing is to see organizing as actually, yes, it is hard. <laughs> it is a craft and it is part of what we're trying to do to change the world and achieve liberation. So I don't expect it to be easy. I don't expect what we ask volunteers to do or members or ourselves as organizers and the conversations we're having and the time and energy we need to spend to be an easy thing or a comfortable thing, right? Actually, I have an orientation towards it of that it will not be. And what we're asking people to do is extremely uncomfortable, right? But I think there's a lot of fear of failure and a lot of fear of a lot of things when we're asking people for things, because that's also a piece of organizing. It's conversations and it's asking people to show up. And there's a lot of feelings that come up with that and a lot of things there. Um, but actually, you know, the other kinds of stories, we don't just tell ourselves stories about volunteers, we tell ourselves stories as well when we think about who we should target and who we should talk to in our different campaigns. It's like, the lowest propensity, the lowest voter turnout people, which are usually people who are the, you know, they're rural people, they're poor working class people, people of color, all kinds of people, right, are low turnout voters. And every time on the left, we never go talk to them. We never, ever, ever go talk to them. And every time we tell ourselves, well, we don't have time, it's last minute in order to win, we actually need to contact the people who are easy to find in the van and easy to get a conversation with. And it will be an easy conversation because probably they just need to be re-registered and they just need to be turned out. And we don't spend time on that harder conversation, but actually the people who should be the base of the left, right? And we don't ever spend time there. So that we create these, self-fulfilling prophecies by telling ourselves what's too hard, what's too difficult, what would take too much time or what volunteers or members, whoever wouldn't want to do. And I'm giving examples and, and there's lots of different kinds of examples, but I think like what I've taken away from doing deep canvassing, which is this really hard thing, right? That seems unbelievable that we could go take someone who really is so not with us, says horrible things, and by the end of a conversation, they can be transformed. And I think because I've seen that work and I know the things that are possible and even, but also how much work it takes to get that, I think that's what becomes frustrating hearing stories of what we can or cannot do and letting them lead our organizing and in, in, in our decisions. Um, and that sometimes we're taking we are telling ourselves stories rather than taking accountability for what we need to try to do to win liberation, right? Um, and, you know, avoiding discomfort, avoiding these things is, is, is not the decision-making strategy that we should be using. Rather, it's what do we need to win? What do we need to do to win and what do we need to get? And so, um, yeah, I think that that this is a huge piece of it. And of course, there are other things, but some of the things I'm about to talk about are like the things to build in. And I think my biggest takeaway always in organizing is that we need to give things the time that it takes. We need to give things the expansiveness that it takes and slow down. But that's very hard to do because there's always such urgency and there's always such a push to try to get numbers get high, you know, high conversation numbers or things like that, but actually centering again on this idea that first and foremost, our conversations and our strategies need to be effective and need to be towards liberation. And that's what we need to be choosing, not the easiest thing, not a race to the bottom um, of, of what we're trying to do. And, you know, recently, just an example of that is I was working with showing up for racial justice to try to figure out where we wanted to do our presidential campaign in, in 2020. God, I can't believe that's already quite a while ago. And there was a conversation about 
doing persuasion, doing persuasion in Pennsylvania where everybody else was, right? Everybody else is in Pennsylvania and it's this opportunity, especially as people who organize, you know, white people, rural people, things like that, to do this persuasion that seemed really important to, to move people who weren't with us, move Trump voters. Um, but actually the decision we ended up making that I think was absolutely the right decision was to instead look at a place like Georgia, which seems like you couldn't flip it, like it's not worth spending the time there, and recognizing how many people just never vote in Georgia, how many people who actually should be with us in our base, a poor working class, like rural white people in the South, that we can go have a conversation that is harder and longer, but ultimately contribute to flipping that state while also building our base and bringing the people in and actually talking to the people who we want to be organizing. Yes, we could be going and spending our time with Trump voters who we can move, but that we're not going to then organize afterwards, right? And so it's like thinking about how we make these decisions and, and choosing a harder thing or maybe a less sure thing as well. Um, right, so these are some examples and um, of ways that I think it gets in our way of, of making choices. And there's lots of, I have lots of other stories, but um, I want to keep moving um, and talk a little bit more specifically in our organizing, what we can do um, to invest in like organizing more effectively. So let's see, sorry, that full screen. So the work that I think we need to take the time for, and it's kind of what I'm getting at is like, making the time for systems and things that allow us to do these things um, as we move into any kind of organizing that we do around a conversation that's effective. And that first one is actually test your scripts, test your conversations, test them out each and every one before you use them. Um, and I, I think in some ways this seems simple, but it's really, I think so important. Again, I know I'm gonna hit it home is that like, we have to be making sure we're effective. We have to be making sure that what we're doing really works and that we also understand and are highly skilled in what we are doing. So we have to test it out. And the other thing that I think is a very different orientation that comes from deep canvassing, but in a way I think we need to apply it to all of our other organizing, because deep canvassing is so hard, because it's such a high level skill conversation, what we really learned was we had to train really in-depthly for it, for any volunteer or person to be able to show up and have these conversations on that day. There was no way we could just bring people in, do a hello everyone, quick role play, here's how to use, here's how to read turf and go out on the doors. That we were leaving people out to dry, going to talk, we, we would just leave them to talk to people who were against us and just have a horrible experience and never want to come back and not be effective at all, right? We had to invest in like an hour and a half to two hour long training before every ship to give people the orientation, the political education, the skills, all, all the things necessary to actually be able to go and have this conversation. And the other thing that we built into that training was a ton of leadership development and roles around people who could coach people while we were having this conversation too. And actually what we realized is that we needed to train for everything because it raised the quality of the conversations. It raised the quality of what people are able to do. And when people are expected to do something well, they actually want to, and they want to come back for it. When we invest in people's ability and I, to do this. And so I think one orientation that is important to have is actually expect your volunteers, your members, whoever you are organizing to be as good and effective at every conversation you have an organizing conversation as you are. And invest in their ability to do that. Invest in your organizing and your systems so that that's possible. Um, and I think that's something that we really learned is that making the time, extending how long you ask volunteers to be there so that they are trained fully. Same for your recruitment phone banks or anything like that that you're doing. Same for anything, have a training, have a real thing that invests in people's ability to do this and invest in coaching as well. Um, and I, I think that goes along with expecting and recognizing what organizing really is and 
this thing of like it is a high level skill and actually we need to invest in everyone who's showing up as if that's true and make it possible for them to do that um and so again though these things take a lot of time the process of testing your script the process of writing and training that really helps people and works is a long process the process of developing leaders and turning them into coaches to show up to your phone banks and help people within your your canvases your phone banks, whatever your membership conversations like all of this takes a lot of time and so when i'm planning a campaign or planning something i'm planning to do actually what i know i need to do is look back and start way sooner way 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 sooner than most campaigns start and i think that's another thing that really gets in our way it's not just you know our feelings of fear scarcity or whatever that's there for us that's a piece of it but there are really concrete things money time all of that but time is this biggest thing right actually we need to be planning out much further in advance to be prepared to be as effective as we want to be um and we need to be investing in things like that so um i'm like aware of time and i'm trying to not just go on and on um, but these are the things that we need to do to try to like maximize organizing and so this is some of the the orientation right to organizing that comes out of deep canvassing that i'm trying to kind of get across in a way but i also next do you want to talk a little bit about the actual conversations themselves with deep canvassing like what is happening when we're doing persuasion with people and having these deeper conversations um yeah and i'm just going to get a little bit into that and then we'll have time after that for questions and answers um, but i did want to try to ground some of this in some of the actual organizing orientations to this um so i, I do want to talk a little bit about what it means to right bring people to our side and i actually think one there, there's some distinctions that don't always get made within what that means both in, in and especially in terms of deep canvassing because many people want to learn how to do this um and i think the and many people have different ways of defining it and i think how i would define deep canvassing is this number one thing here which is helping people process their oppressive worldview and the emotions underneath it um and that's in that's that's in in conversation with people who are against us right in some way or another so you know for example someone who's who like yeah against marriage right helping them process this worldview this story that they have and also the emotions underneath it and to offer them a new worldview a different way of seeing it. And I'm gonna get a little more concrete into that in a second, this deep canvassing piece. But the other part that I don't think we, we talk about as much in deep canvassing or think about is the deep conversations of helping people process their oppression and offering them action. And that is so much of organizing conversations that are happening, that happen a lot, that we have all the time in different places and in different ways, and that I know we all engage in it's sort of recruitment it's agitation it's activating people it's inviting people in and recognizing that these are deep conversations as well like and going there with people is something we should invest in and think about as a conversation itself um and one of the reasons i bring it up and i want to give an example of actually how this can be a little bit of deep canvassing is not everyone recognizes their oppression <laughs> There are some people who are ready to go. They're ready to be for you to ask them, what's my story? How do I understand what I want or need? What's my struggle, right? And we want to connect around struggle. And I think that sometimes we take for granted that people are there. Some people are there and ready to go. They understand I'm, I'm poor, I'm, you know, I'm trans, I'm whatever, and I can recognize my oppression and I'm ready to do that. That's not always actually true though. That's not always actually where people are at, and it can be a very emotional and difficult process to walk people through to bring them in, but it's a piece we need to do as well with people and invest in how we do that. And so, for example, you know, I was in conversation with an organization that I was working with that organizes, you know, white women, and 
there was this question of should we have a conversation with white women about to try to lower their racial resentments, their racism, or a conversation about, I think the way they said it was like internalized sexism. And actually both, it's not like white women are automatically right there to understand like, yes, as a woman, I wanna show up, especially like conservative white women, that's a deep conversation to have. It's just as deep of a conversation actually, in some ways, as trying to move them on some other way that they are oppressors, but recognizing their own oppression and role in that and how it fits in with their entire you know life and worldview right that's unplugging something pretty big as well and so i guess i wanted to like you know especially as for a group that i i'm getting the impression is like talking really relating people across struggle that not everyone's there and we need to invest in those conversations too and most of deep canvassing most 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 of it is about flipping someone's oppressive worldview and offering them something new. So I'm going to talk about that um, and what we're what what that means and, and, and what we're looking for and what is an understanding of of where deep canvassing is and where it comes from. And so and this is my orientation towards and several people who I've worked with for a long time's orientation of deep canvassing and there are different views of it. You know, that's also true. Um, for me you know systems our systems of oppression right are held up by stories um those stories are you know lies right mostly um but they make people feel big feelings right and that's what they're intended to do and conservatives and and the status quo whatever not even just conservatives many you know it's neoliberalism it's all these things are held up by these stories right that that bring people specific feelings and the three feelings that are usually underneath it the three pieces that are usually a part of all of these stories are fear scarcity and dehumanization which when those things are present and people buy into those stories and believe them it makes a lot of horrible things possible it makes people pos capable of doing a lot of horrible things um, and being very you know what we believe are not you know the culture where we want to live and so so for example when we think about immigration when we think about stories about immigrants and there's this there's stories that immigrants are going to take our jobs um right so that's scarcity right the idea that there's not enough jobs there are not enough money and resources to go around um that's a story right that is a piece of this immigrants are different Immigrants are maybe dangerous as well. They don't share our culture, our values. This is this attempt at dehumanization. They are not like us, and therefore you can start to see them differently than you, right? All of these things combined. So there's fear, there's scarcity of resources, there's dehumanization happening. And ultimately, people buying in and believing these stories allows people to do things they would never believe they would do. I'm sure if you ask the people who were for Trump, splitting families and putting kids in cages they would not actually theoretically believe that they're in support of that and yet they're doing it it's what's happening um and it is really this belief in this story but really not being able to process the feelings that come up with it um another experiment that actually was done showed people there was a poll there was a test like a a survey of how people felt about immigrants um and then they took those groups and one group was the placebo group and one group was saw images and told a lot about germs about like different kinds of germs and bacteria which makes people feel all these things and then they were retested and people who were introduced to just that idea of infection and bacteria and things coming in they rated lower on their feelings about immigrants afterwards, right? There's ways to just bring things up. When we feel fear and all of these things, it makes us more conservative. It's just what happens. And so the other side, however you want to refer to them, are very good at telling these kind of stories um, that, that move people that way. And again, this is why when we think about persuasion, it isn't about facts because people are not making their decisions on facts about this. It really is these feelings underneath. And so, um, another another piece it's also you know many times i think we we make our scripts about this message that someone just needs to hear this one fact or message that if i tell them this if only they know this 
they would be on our side. And that is also not true. It does not work. I think we want to believe it does. We really want to hold that that's true and that education and educating people is just all that people need. And I've seen it over and over again. It, it does not work. Um, our, our like one-off messaging things, we need to go deeper than that. We need to do more than that to actually move people to be with us and put in some serious work into these conversations. Um, and so one of the scripts that I want to just give an example of, and I'm on the next slide, I actually have just like a breakdown of what it kind of looks like. Um, but we created an abolition deep canvas script um, in 2019 um, around, it was about a divest invest campaign around jails in Los Angeles County, which is the largest jail system in the world. Um, and so we went out and, and had conversations to figure out what would it take to move people on this, but not just move them you know, there's really some low hanging fruit there in that conversation of like, oh, you know, people, many people are there for like drugs, addiction, uh, mental health, things like that. And that's kind of, you know, you could go towards that, but we really wanted to have a deeper conversation that moved people towards actual abolition, seeing and understanding that jails are not a system we should invest in. And so, the things that we learned in that, the lies, the stories that people were telling themselves that we needed to shift were, you know, people are good or they're bad. Um, and bad people can be inhumanely punished, right? It's that dehumanization there. Um, you know, and some people are dangerous and jails keep us safe, right? Which, which also isn't really true. Um, and when people make mistakes, they should be punished, right? And punishment works. And so the fear there is like, if we don't have jails, if we don't have prisons, violent people can be around to hurt us. Um, these people who don't deserve anything better than, than jail or prison. Um, and what we, the worldview that we try to help shift people towards, the story, the new story that we wanted to help people be able to tell um, was really that actually no one is good or bad. Everyone is capable of both. And typically experiencing harm, trauma, and oppression leads us to do harm to others, um, or at least to do desperate things um, that, that often end up in jail. Punishment is actually just a form of harm. It's, it's a form of trauma. It, it recreates the cycle. And that meeting people's needs is actually what changes, people, changes things for us and makes us safe. Um, and that punishment as a cultural orientation is, is bad for us, right? And so that's what we were trying to, to, to move people towards and that we realized was actually underneath this. There are many, many things happening around jail and prison, right? It's, it's class, it's race, it's all of these things. And yet underneath it is this orientation and this lie about safety and about things like that. Um, and so the other thing that we offer is not just a new story or like a new worldview orientation, it's connecting it to real experiences in their life. It's through their own stories and their own real lived experience that we process these, these, these worldviews. And the thing that is really on our side that actually I think is like a piece of deep canvassing that gives me the most amount of hope is that the stories that they tell and the feelings that they give people really are not their own. They're not referencing something that actually happens in someone's life. They're giving fear to them through these stories, scarcity, all of that. But when we talk about real people's lives and their experiences and the real feelings that they have about that, what's really true for them, it is a much more powerful thing actually than, than this imaginary thing that's offered by the right so often to people. Um, that's why marriage conversations were so powerful because we actually talked about love, about people's real experience with marriage, which is like, is it this hater hetero patriarchy institution that you get to like, yes, it is all these things for you. Is it about that? But like when you think about actually getting married and what it means to you, that's a very different thing than this imagined thing you were offered, systemic oppressive thing you were offered, right? And so that's 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 a piece of what we're doing here. So I want to show you, um, you know, what this abolition script 
kind of looks like because I know that's very theoretical and it is very hard to explain outside of an organizing context to someone how deep canvassing works. Um, it really just doesn't live outside of organizing, but this is the, the basic body essentially, I guess, of, of a deep canvas script. So you have your introduction, here's who we are, and you get your first rating on a zero to 10 scale. How do you feel about jail reform, right? Um, and we really work hard to pull out in that first rating, what is the story they tell themselves about jail? every piece and what you really want to hear and not avoid is all the horrible things they're going to say you actually want them to say it out loud you want them to you want to get it all out and hold it without judgment of what someone says because later the the thing that's happening and what we're working through when you think about you know like what's happening in people's brains is there's cognitive dissonance there that we have to pull apart people and make them look at right um and there's ways to do that but right the first rating is really pulling out what's the story you tell yourself about jails and then we go into story exchanges where we ask them about someone they know who went to jail and what their experience was of that and instantly what that does is take people out of this theoretical people are good or bad, but actually, when you think about someone you know, you, you can't apply black and white thinking as easily already to that. So that's part of the reason when we talk about someone they know. Um, and then, then there are other pieces happening there too. But then the second story we talk about is actually we talk about harm. We say, okay, you are scared of harm and this is about harm and we think we're protecting ourselves, then let's talk about harm in our real lives, in our families, in our, you know, in our lives and there is a lot of harm typically happening in a lot of places in families and work and in, in, in all kinds of places that are intimate to us and this is a really vulnerable story to ask people to tell right it's a very very vulnerable thing um but it's actually the level of vulnerability and conversation that we need to be having to move people on a system so deeply held as jails and, and prison that comes it's a legacy of so many things in our country right a legacy of slavery a legacy of all kinds of things right and so we have to go this deep and so we do we ask people okay well let's let you let's talk about cycles of trauma and harm and what that means and make a connection between the fact that jails and prisons are a continuation of this um and then we make the case for why this is important and this is the point at which we can actually talk about some facts when we've addressed these underlying feelings, these underlying things for people, this is where we can actually say some facts that are true about this system and that people can hear them. Um, and it's also where we address their concerns that are still lingering about this. So this is the basic outline of an abolition deep canvas, but also typically what a deep canvas script looks like, um, which is why it's so long and why it's such an in-depth conversation. Um, and every deep canvas is different. Every story that you need, that you exchange, the kind of stories you exchange are different, but there are mechanisms within it that stay constant, that we don't have time to go, go into all of it. Um, we are running out of time as we speak. Um, and I wanna make sure I have time for questions. Um, but I think, you know, yeah, I guess what I'm trying to give everyone today, and, and what I wanna be clear about is that this hour of time, this webinar is not enough time for me to teach you how to do deep canvassing, right? Like, like I've said, it, it needs to be grounded in the work, in an issue that you're working on, in a script, in a model. Um, but I, I did want to, I know people want this skill and, and it's my deepest wish that people across the movement had it and were able to have these conversations. And that I truly believe it also is connected to the way we organize and the way we approach, and that deep canvassing is not the only kind of conversation that we need to be investing in or, or thinking about how we make good conversations happen all over the place in our organizing, not just for the persuasion that we wanna do with other people. Um, but yeah, and that time is something we need to give ourselves um, in our organizing. So I think, yeah, I was, I'm, I'm at time for this, and I know we wanted to have some questions so I think maybe I'll just stop sharing my screen let's see hopefully that worked um yeah I don't know if we wanted to take time for questions 
Okay, yeah. Ash, while, while people are thinking about uh, their, their or formulating their questions in their in their head, uh, I'd like for you to treat the, uh, the people uh, say that, uh, like for a long time we thought, um, and we still think, um, approaching people based on their economic interests mm -hmm. is what will move them. But what we're hearing now is that there's this thing called values. And so, so what I'd like for you to speak to while people are formulate, formulating their questions, what's the relationship between moving people on the issues about which we think they should be concerned and their values and trying to, mm. yeah, okay. So I'm looking, but before you yeah. respond, yeah. Uh, if you'd like to raise a question, um, then please use, please take your mouse cursor, put it on the picture of the hand, click the hand, and we will know that you want to introduce a question and we'll be able to uh, open your mic. We don't have a lot of time, so uh, I apologize. This is Dee Miles, by the way, and I work with the National Education Commission. And I apologize uh, from the start. We don't have a lot of time, but we'll uh, take as many questions as we can. Ash? Yeah, yeah. So you said the phrase, move people what we think they should be moved on. And I think it's an interesting thing because I think it, it comes down to what is movement, right? There's like, and yeah, an economic interest. And I think that that's kind of the thing I was trying to get at with there's deep canvassing in that we want to move people from being against us to for us, but that doesn't necessarily move people into taking action in the movement and for themselves and the things that are important to them. And that's why deep canvassing is actually a very limited, it's actually a very limited strategy that, that should really be used when persuasion actual like real persuasion you need to move people which we always need we know that we need that but there's also i think a piece that gets missed and and what you're talking about is like how do we move people and organize people based on what is they their interest and to save themselves essentially like their own liberation right and i think that that that's a piece that we need to work on what those conversations look like because assuming that someone is prepared to do that and i think that's the different orientations is that you know working at surge and thinking about poor working class white people and what you need to do to move them move them into action or move them to be and there's a question i think that everyone asks is like is it important to have conversations about racism and lowering people's racism with people with with this group of people who it's assumed that that's something they need versus having a conversation to about their own interests to bring them into the, the movement and i think like my what from what i've seen in that that question is that yes we should be moving people based on because that's what organizing ultimately needs to be is not is what do you want to show up for for yourself and i actually think that we cannot replace what it means to be in community and organize together and the the movement, the, ed, the the things that come out of that, the conversations that come out of that and people's own experiences being the thing that can lead them to so many things over a deep canvas that takes so much energy and time and a one-off conversation. Like I think bringing people into the movement is a much more important and effective way to move people at the end of the day because you it allows them to be organized um, and there is a need also for these other conversations it's just it's a question of when um, okay. I don't know if that answers you. so let's yeah, yeah let's take a question from the audience Justin your mic is open please uh, use your mouse cursor put it on the picture of the mic click it and your mic and your mic will open on your end Justin Brizen put your mouse cursor Okay, the person disappeared. 
Hmm. Okay, hold on a second. All right, just a minute. Janice, your mic is open. There you are. Thank you. This was brilliant. I really appreciate uh, your talking to us, Ash. Um, I'm wondering what other types of conversations besides deep canvassing do you think would help us in our organizing? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think uh, many, you know, that's the thing. I guess that's part of what I'm try trying to say in this is that, like, I think part of what the tool, like, I think so many people think deep canvassing is the tool that needs to be given to people, but actually the, the skills to create the conversations you need for organizing yourself is like these deeper conversations and to test them and to try them out. And I think there's so many conversations that are needed. You know, part of what I know is said a lot now in different funder spaces and different things is like that that volunteer organizing is like not worth the money. <laughs> it's like not scalable. It's like not something that people should do or that paid canvassing is like everything that everyone should invest in. And actually, I think we haven't invested enough in how to have really good recruitment conversations with people and like help people show up which is a piece of this when we're talking about bringing people in based on economic interest, well then that's essentially like how do we tap into that and have a conversation that, that you know, helps people process that and agitate them and, 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 you know, light them on fire basically to show up for something. Like if we can't, yeah, if we're not investing in even our ability to get people to show up to things, let alone these bigger conversations. Like I just think overall it's about we have we have to test things out and believe that we're supposed to hit a standard that's higher than I think what we expect for ourselves. Um, and you know I've seen that the kind of scale that can happen with good volunteer recruitment. But yeah, so I think I'm kind of getting into a lot of it of just there's a lot of stories that go into us trying things and failing, but not actually investing in this kind of iterative process of making it better. Um, so every conversation I feel like is something we need to be investing in um and they're all very connected um in at the in the end i don't know the answer okay. To okay thank you william your mic is open william sailor there you are click it again you had it click it again there you are hello ash i great i greatly appreciate you sharing the system yours and it's very insightful but the question i have is as we're perfecting uh, the the system and learning it to put it into practice ourselves, how can we tell that it's gone too long, that we might want to go and move on, but yet leave the person or people uh, with thought provoking uh, that later on, I mean, it, it might work when they're home alone or the next day. How can we plant the seed and move on or do we? You mean in like an individual Thanks. conversation? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, individual conversation or even in a group setting. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you can see, when you can read the group and you're not getting, you're not making no headway. You, you yeah. hit a brick wall. Well, it, it sounds like you know what that feels like. It sounds like you understand when you've got there. Um, and I guess, you know, I would say, you know, yeah, it's an interesting way to answer that question because it's like, what should you do? But one thing is like, you you kind of have to tell yourself and ask yourself that something you did up to that point was didn't work, right? Like, you know, it's really more of a question of what do you need to do different to end up somewhere different? Um, and the, the other thing is not all conversations, there's no 100% effectivity rate of any conversation ever. That's not so part of what is a piece of testing out scripts is also recognizing quickly enough this conversation is not going anywhere and that's okay versus i'm not there's something that needs to change about how we're having this conversation and distinguishing them is not an easy thing to do but it sounds like you know what it feels like 
when you're not being effective. And so I think if that's a consistent thing, then there, or if you've not seen success, right? You have to ask yourself what, what's happening there. Is that on me? Am I, is there something I need to do different? Or yeah, this idea of planting a seed. Yeah, maybe that's what needs to happen, but maybe your approach needs to look different. Um, yeah. Okay, Justin, I see your hand again. Um, Justin, put your mouse cursor, put your mouse clicker on your mic, click it, and it'll open on your end. Justin Brisson. Okay. All right. We've actually run out of time. Uh, Ash will need to, he, he just, okay, thank you. I'll leave you alone. Um, so we need to invite you back, uh, Ash, okay. because there, I, some people have written their questions. We don't uh, read questions from the written uh, uh, box. We ask that you uh, verbalize your question. Um, uh, so there are a number of questions, question marks, meaning that people have written their questions, but we're not reading them. Okay. So we need to invite you, we'd like to invite you back maybe in the spring and maybe we'll uh, create a space where you'll have uh, more time and you can actually teach us the um, specific skill. But let us, let me ask you this question. So mm -hmm. if you're in a conversation with someone and it's the first conversation, what percentage, if you can pr put a percentage on it, if, 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 if A is the organizer, what percentage of time should A be talking versus the percentage of time that the person they're talking to should be talking? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think it's like probably about 70, 30 that the voter or person, I, I say voter, I do a lot of voter contact, but like member, whoever, you know, should, it's really more about them processing things than anything that you have to say. Um, like our role is almost as facilitator of their processing of, of, of these stories, yeah. So you're saying 30% of the time the organizer and 70% of the time the, the, the person they're talking to? Okay, all right, so you've given us basic pieces uh, pieces that we can use. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for taking of your time. Ash has three children and 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 is is on demand everywhere. So we really appreciate that they took of their time to, to join with us tonight. We hope that they will make time to join with us again uh, in the spring when maybe we could do a two-hour thing mm. where you really get into some detail and 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 help us. The working class in this country is suffering and insult to injury. The suggestion is that our, that our working class is not suffering. But mm -hmm. I think the truth of the matter is that our working class is suffering. And uh, in order to move from, um, and, and in order to re relieve that suffering, we have to help them take part in the process that will change the society in which we live. So we thank you, Ash, for helping, and we thank everyone for participating. We had over 600 people to register for this class tonight. So that means that there is a demand, there is an interest, and we appreciate Ash as the facilitator, and we appreciate all of the participants. So good night for now, uh, uh, and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.